This week on Christian World News, a special report, crisis in Iraq. Since the ISIS army invaded northern Iraq last year, tens of thousands of Christians are without homes or jobs. How will they survive? And do they even have a future? And ISIS has taken more than homes and churches. This mother grieves for her four-year-old daughter taken by ISIS fighters. Still, she hopes and prays for her safe return. And a martyr's family. How this woman and her three children kept the faith after her husband was murdered. And her joy at learning at his death was not in vain. A visit to the suffering Christians of northern Iraq. Hello, everyone. I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. Tens of thousands of Christian refugees are homeless and desperate for help in northern Iraq. Our friends at the Voice of the Martyrs Canada recently visited several towns in that region, and they brought back some stories of heartbreak and hope. Yeah, from a mother desperately praying for the return of her daughter to the pastor who believes he'll lead his people back to their church and their homes one day. VOM's Canada's Greg Musselman brings us the special report from a village in northern Iraq. The brutality demonstrated by Islamic State, also known as ISIS over the past year, has forced tens of thousands of Christians to flee from cities in Iraq with significant Christian populations like Mosul and Quetta Kush. Most come to Kurdistan, Iraq's northern autonomous Kurdish region seeking safety and shelter. Hans and his wife Hala left everything behind in Bartella, which is located near Mosul, escaping just before ISIS arrived. They come in the night when Kurdish forces withdraw from our areas. So uh, the ISIS come in the night, in the, about 3 or 4 a.m. And then we took our things, uh, only clothes, and then we flee to this uh, place. I felt like everything was destroyed and I lived in fear because I worried about my family, my husband. They destroyed everything in our lives. 195 Christian families, that's 825 people, along with 25 Yazidis families, came here to Hazani. They came from eight surrounding villages. Now they were chased from their homes because of the violent assaults of Islamic State, also known as ISIS. They received Bible Plus packs from the Voice of the Martyrs. When we heard the news of this terrible situation, our hearts started to cry for you, and we started to pray very hard. We told people about your story, and they had tears coming down. And we asked them, please, not only pray, but give some money so we can help. I want to thank God for you people coming here and remembering us in this situation. It's important to pray for us, for our children, our families. It's a very difficult life here. I pray God will give you more so you can continue to help us. There are many displaced Christians in Iraq. Some are living in tents or an unfinished shopping mall in the Kurdish capital of Erbil, which is being utilized as an emergency shelter for more than 200 Christian families or 1,500 people. Some have found refuge in churches. Here in Koya, 128 families are housed in two churches as they face an uncertain future. Who Sam is a married father of two young sons and left a shoe business behind that he owned before the ISIS takeover of Kerakush. Now, prior to the attacks, Hussam was able to provide a comfortable home for his young family in what was considered Iraq's largest Christian city. Although he and his wife are very thankful to have a safe place of refuge to which they can care for their children, they must share a small space inside a church facility, along with Hussam's parents, plus his brothers and their families. 
In the morning of the 6th of August, we heard bombs everywhere. Those explosions killed two children in our neighborhood. I felt I needed to protect my family and was feeling fear, so I decided to leave immediately. As for the future, Hussam, like many other displaced Iraqi Christians, just wants to go home and return to normal life, life the way they had once known it. Yet failing that, he will need to find another country where he can look after his family in safety. Our chief international correspondent Gary Lane joins us with more. He has been to Iraq, to this part of the world, many, many times. Gary, what is the worst thing you have seen or even heard from the refugees? I think one of the worst ones uh, we're going to hear coming up here in the next segment, a woman who had her little girl taken away from her, just mm -hmm. kidnapped. But I met a man from Mosul. His brother was killed by ISIS, and then they came for him, and they put AK-47s in his face, and they said to him, look, you give us your home and the keys to your car, and you can leave. Otherwise, we're going to kill you. Mm. So he left. And I would say most of the Christians uh, probably didn't experience death in that way, uh, but they lost their homes, they lost their cars, all their belongings, and they just had to leave. Almost 1.5 million of these refugees are, Kur are Kurds. Um, how are they doing? Well, I, I think they're doing fairly well. You know, when it first happened in June and then throughout well, the they summer. Left, they, they fled to Kurdistan. Yeah, they fled yeah, to Kurdistan. Yeah, yeah. They weren't Kurds, but yeah, yeah. Uh, some of them were, of course. Yeah. But uh, when they left in June through August, it was a very rough situation because mm -hmm. Kurdistan, very small area population-wise, now one out of five people are refugees. Imagine trying to handle that. That would be like 60 million people in the United States mm -hmm. coming in. How would we handle that? So put a lot of pressure on their infrastructure there, on the government, but now today, about nine months later, people are doing very well. They're being fed, they're being clothed, they're being housed, but daily needs are tremendous. International community needs to keep it up. We have, we saw in the last few days, uh, a massive assault by the Iraqi uh, forces, yes. 30,000 of them backed by Shiite militia, as well as the Iranian elite Quds force. ISIS is on the defensive right now. Is it safe for Christians to go back? No, it isn't safe for them to go back, uh, especially those Christian villages. They're not far from Mosul, just across the river from Mosul, yeah. because they're still within mortar range. Artillery can be fired into those villages. A lot of the homes are booby-trapped now, so it is not safe for them to go back, but many are still hoping eventually they can get there. What's likely to happen in the days ahead? Well, in the days ahead, if ISIS isn't stopped, you're going to see more atrocities, not only against Christians, but also the Yazidis, who have suffered even worse than the Christians. Mm -hmm. But the pastors are telling me we could see down to about 150,000 Christians only mm. in Iraq of a population wow. at one time that was 1.2, 1.4 million. Wow, unbelievable. Gary, they're I They're leaving, know, George. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they're, they're getting visas and going. Yeah, well, I know that you are on top of this. Please continue to yes. give us the latest. You can okay. find it on your blog, as well as on CBNnews.com, as well as on Christian sure. World News. As always, sir, great to have you back. Wendy? And as Gary just mentioned, a heartbreaking story coming up, a mother's anguish. ISIS took her four-year-old daughter. Now she's praying for her daughter's safe return. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? 
How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. And welcome back to our special report. The brutality of Islamic State fighters is not limited to murder and destruction. That's right. It expands into the horrific world of sex slavery. Greg Musselman continues his special report with this story of a Christian mother who suffered a devastating loss. Ida Hanna also wants to live in safety with her family. But as you'll soon hear, that is not her first priority right now. Ida's story is heartbreaking and demonstrates the evil and coldness of ISIS. She tells of the events leading up to her ongoing nightmare. On the 6th of August, ISIS attacked Karakush. I heard the explosions. Many people, including children and young people, died in the attack. For the next 10 days, Ida and her husband Badu, who was blind, and their three-year-old daughter Christina stayed in their home, not knowing what would happen next, living in fear. Thankfully, her other three children, including her 11-year-old son Christmas, had escaped to safety. Suddenly, ISIS broke their silence. From the loudspeakers, we heard Allah Akbar, and the ISIS people announced all the Christians needed to leave the area, and if we didn't, they said they were going to kill us. They also said you can stay if you accept Islam. Do that or leave. The militant Muslim group then rounded up all the Christians and brought them to a health center and briefly separated the men from the women. They opened our luggage and took things like gold and money and left our luggage on the ground and made us go to the bus. After that, me, my husband and daughter all went to the bus. We didn't take anything. I just held my daughter. Suddenly, one of the ISIS people just took her. He took my daughter from me. I started crying and my husband asked me what had happened. I said, they have taken our daughter. I followed him off the bus into a building. Ida says Christina was then given to an older man with a long beard. She believes he was the leader of the ISIS group in that area and described him as having evil eyes. She pleaded with him to give her young daughter back, but he ordered her to get back on the bus. He told her to shut up and that if she said another word or came near her daughter, he would call his men to slaughter her right there. I was begging him and my daughter was crying and screaming because she needed her mother. But he looked at me with his dark eyes and said, go now, and I started to cry. I felt like they were going to kill me if I stayed even one more minute. Ida returned to the bus distraught. Her husband was unable to chase after his wife and daughter because of his blindness. The Christians were then taken to the desert and dropped off with nothing. From there, they had to walk seven hours to get to Erbil, where they were finally given food, water and shelter in tents. Later, they would move to this unfinished shopping mall. When we arrived here, my oldest son, who was 23 years old, asked me, where is my sister? And I told him that she was taken, that she is gone. He became like crazy and started to cry and said they can't do that. Although Ida reported to the local authorities in Erbil that her daughter was abducted by ISIS, she was told there was little they could do. Three times she tried to go back to her village, but each time was prevented by the guards at the checkpoint from doing so, fearing ISIS would kill her. I'm only asking God for my daughter to be returned to me. I need my daughter to come to me, to be back on my knee and that she is healthy. That is all I need. I'll never lose hope that I will see her again. I just don't know when. I believe God can do it. I have dreams about her every single day. VOM partner Ray Thorne read an emotional letter from a mother in the U.S. to Ida. Words cannot express my grief over the loss of your little girl. I read your story and I sat and wept 
while I was at work. She said, I wept for you and your family. She said, I have a three-year-old daughter of my own. The thought of losing her is crushing. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Such a heartbreaking story. Please join us as we pray for a miracle. We ask all of our viewers to pray right now for that desperate mom and her daughter, wherever she is. And you can share your prayers and encouragements for Iraq's Christians with other believers around the world. Simply post them on our Facebook page. We look forward to seeing your posts. Up next, this pastor's church members escaped ISIS, yet he still has hope that one day he will lead them back to their homes. Kids, do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah! Well, do you? Yeah! Then you're gonna love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Pentecost 2015. From the corners of the earth, believers gather in Jerusalem. Walk where Jesus walked. Pray in Gethsemane. Rejoice at the empty tomb. Don't miss messages from over 100 world-renowned speakers and a score of popular worship artists. For more information and to register for the Empowered 21 Global Congress, go to Jerusalem2015.com. This May, Jerusalem. Well, the ISIS army has driven entire Christian communities out of parts of northern Iraq, and it's even trying to erase all evidence of the Christian faith. However, some of Iraq's Christian uh, leaders aren't willing to just fade away. Greg Musselman met with one pastor who led his people to safety, and he hopes to one day lead them back. Evangelical Pastor Saba, along with his family and congregation members, was also thankful to arrive safely in the city of Erbil. They escaped after ISIS had captured their Christian community of Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, an ancient city that traces its Christian heritage back to the first century. Pastor Saba recounts what took place during the invasion. On the 6th of June, we had an all-night prayer meeting. In the morning, the people were going to their houses, but the roads were closed, and we had to stay at the church for three nights. Every night, we prayed very hard for Mosul. The Christians were told by ISIS they could leave Mosul immediately, leaving everything behind, including their cars. At great risk, Saba approached some of the Islamic jihadists at a checkpoint, asking them if they could take their cars to leave the city. Surprisingly, they said yes. I told them we have families, children. The ISIS people told me this was illegal, but go and get your cars. And we left that night. 
As we started to leave, we heard bombs exploding everywhere. We left very fast. The ISIS people took over the whole city. Saba, his family, and others from the church took the first road to Erbil, which is about 90 kilometers from Mosul. But before they could get into Erbil, they would have to wait over 14 hours at a checkpoint as Kurdish troops would search each vehicle for members of ISIS. I was afraid, but I was able to contact all the members of our church, and I knew they were on the road and out of the danger area. You had 18 families in your church, 70 people, ISIS came, you had to disperse, people left. You started the church, you were the church planter. How did you feel when the congregation all had to flee? That was so difficult. I planted the church in 2006 and built up that church. It's a part of me, a part of my body. It was so difficult to see our people have to leave their homes and just walk. These are my people. This is my nation. I am so sorry. Pastor Saba, now in his mid-60s, passed up an opportunity while living in Amman, Jordan, to bring his family to Canada in 2006, instead returning to his hometown of Mosul to start a church. He says his work there isn't finished and hopes to return someday, even though ISIS has taken over his beloved city, church and house and caused so much destruction. One day we will go back, but not right now. It will take some time. Mm, more to pray about, and you can learn more about the Voice of the Martyrs Canada at our Christian World News webpage. Find it at cbnnews.com. Great job, Greg. Come on, Give me Scott. that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need and dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there, providing food, thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I join CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hi, good morning. Are you ready to get started? Pat Robertson recently recorded a very special program to answer the question, does God still heal today? What we're trying to do here, Scott, is to tell people how they can access the power of the living God through Jesus Christ. Discover the answers and let your faith be encouraged. And then Jesus spelled out of how we can have healing and how we can have miracles. In Pat Robertson's latest DVD, Be Healed, you'll learn the biblical basis for healing today, how to exchange anxiety and worry for faith and confidence, the way to pray for your healing and healing for those you love, Plus, meet real people who've experienced the miraculous healing power of God. The first thing I did was reached out for a lifesaver, and that was God. You know, you can put your trust in medicine, but the ultimate healing is going to have to be God. Find out the biblical principles that lead to healing in Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Be Healed. Available now. Finally, in the special report on the Christians of northern Iraq, the story of a martyr who lost his wife even before ISIS attacked. Now his wife and family are afraid for their lives, but they found reason to rejoice in learning that his death is bringing life to others. Hannah's husband, Salman, was murdered by militant Muslims in March of 2012 because of his ministry. He had brought seven Muslims to Christ before he was kidnapped and shot nine times. After Salman was martyred, Hannah and her children went to the Christian city of Kerakush, only to have to flee again when ISIS came to the area in the summer of 2014. 
I felt I needed to run away from them because they are the same people who killed my husband in Mosul. Now they will kill me and my children. So I prepared myself to leave. It was very hard. After leaving Mosul, we started a new home in Karakush. I bought things like furniture. I didn't know what was happening. Now I'm in Erbil and it's very hard. There is more tragedy in my life. Hannah says without Jesus in her life, there is no way she could continue living. After three years since Salman died, it's only Jesus Christ who gives me strength to take what is going on. When I interviewed Hannah in 2013, at that time we needed to hide her identity for security reasons. She said she wanted to stay in Iraq and continue her late husband's ministry in Mosul. But since ISIS has invaded, that's no longer possible. It's just too dangerous. My life is for my children, just to protect them. It's very difficult for me. I like my country, but I can't take it anymore. Hannah's oldest daughter, Sarah, was recently married and living near her in Erbil. Sarah was in her fourth year at the university in Mosul as a biology student. But when ISIS captured the city, they destroyed most of the documents at the university, including all of Sarah's university records. I was getting ready for my final exam of the year, but I couldn't do it because of what happened. That made me angry. I just cried. Sarah says God will find a solution for her education. Sarah is very close to her mother and says her faith and strength helped her deal with her own loss and pain when her father was murdered. It was difficult for her when my dad was killed, but she has been a very good example to me. Hannah had not yet seen the report that we did on her and her husband Salman that not only aired across Canada, but around the world. Rebecca and Ali had been married for over two decades and were raising their three children in Mosul, a large city in the northwest. Hannah got emotional watching the video, but is grateful that the Lord has used it to strengthen Christians in their faith and used it to bring others to Jesus. My husband was a good believer and he evangelized people to believe in Jesus Christ. What he said before he died was that if he died, there would be a reason for it and that others would come to know Jesus. And this is what happened through many TV stations. The Voice of the Martyrs has helped Hannah and her family since the death of Solomon and will continue to do so into the future, for which they are grateful. In Iraqi Kurdistan, I'm Greg Musselman for Christian World News. You know, they say the blood of the martyrs is the seedbed of the church, and you know that God's got great purpose for this part of the world. Yeah. Uh, great thanks again to Greg Musselman mm, you, and Greg. VOM Canada. Thank you so much, folks. Yeah, so much to pray about. Yeah. And that's one thing that we can do. Our prayers do make a difference. Well, until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye and God bless you.